I'm not an economics professor, uh, and I'm not a sociologist, but I don't think that New Orleans is unique in that respect. I mean, maybe if you go to a city like Atlanta, you may see some differences there, but I don't think that we're unique when I say we, black people, uh, making up the majority of a population in, in, a, in an urban metro, uh, metropolis, but not controlling the finances. So that's something that we, we see across America, and I think a lot of it is rooted in uh, the history of this nation. You know, I mean, this, the Civil Rights Act didn't pass until the 60s. You know, um, you know, I mean, so so for a very long time, black people were intentionally kept out of uh, thriving in society, intentionally. And while we've made progress, while we've seen advancement, we're, we're talking about, you know, my, my father was uh, a teenager, you know, at that time. So we, we you know, we, we, we have a long way to make up to try to advance, to be in the, uh, the, the position to control resources or um, uh, the question that you asked about controlling economics in, in any city, not just New Orleans, right? Um, New Orleans is still in Louisiana, which is still very much the Deep South. So even though New Orleans is a quote-unquote progressive city in comparison to the rest of the state, we're still in the South. And the South, the South has been historically racist in terms of policies that have been put in place uh, over many, many, many generations. And, and we're talking about 60 years in comparison to three to 400 years. I mean, that number's been consistent for decades, though. And as a matter of fact, it's 10% worse uh, post-Katrina. Uh, the uh, income gap uh, actually widened uh, 10%. Even with the 71 billions of recovery money coming to this community, uh, the disparity uh, widened 10% in terms of income between whites and, and blacks. That's because African Americans have always been a uh, service uh, uh, level, a service industry class here in the city. Is it may look at the, the old reports that Tim Singleton and Howard Smalls did years ago, which showed that uh, over 120,000 people came to work in the city every day. They had all the upper level and middle level jobs. I think their total income at that time was about three and a half billion dollars. But at five o'clock they left. So we were left with, uh, do you want some fries with that shake? You know, can I puff up your pillow? Roll back your bed? And that's been the history of this town, uh, especially when it, when it relates to our black folk. New Orleans, after Hurricane Katrina, had $72 billion hit our small, very small city. A, a large chunk of that, believe it or not, was around education and education reform. And everything from innovation grants to um, Wilson Foundation, Gates Foundation. So we're talking about tons of philanthropy money, plus the money coming down from Hurricane Katrina, plus the money that that was literally just kind of sitting there because they fired all the teachers, but Louisiana had already given them money to retain those teachers. So you had the money that was the teachers was already supposed to get once because they fired all the teachers. Literally right after the storm, the teachers were FedEx their last checks, right? They were, they fire all the teachers, and I said teachers, they fire all the staff, teachers, principals, yeah. everybody. Maybe so they, they fire cafeteria ladies. They fired 7,800 people in total. Which was the black middle class. Which Ooh. was the black middle class. Um, they But they had the money to pay them. So it was illegal and shady as hell. But then you had all these innovation grants coming down the recovery school district took over and they also gave them a chunk of money to recover the schools because what they did was they raised the score of a failing school to 87.5 so they could take over the majority of schools so then the majority of New Orleans schools were quote unquote failing and you want you gonna hear why that's a quote unquote failing because so they got a big chunk of money also from the federal and state to recover the school so I mean that's just money everywhere right so you got all this money so because you have all this money, a lot of people were hopeful, especially when you look up the definition of charter schools. Charter schools are supposed to be when teachers, parents, and community come together and develop curriculum and what the things they feel that their children need to thrive, right? right. So the how charter schools were originally envisioned 
beautiful. We have all this money and we can envision everything we want. And then the first charter schools as they came around, they started having meetings where they would ask the community, what do y'all want in these schools? And I sat in a lot of those meetings. I sat in lots of those meetings. And you would hear parents say things like, we need to bring back all the trades. Everything from auto mechanic to, you know, Olympic size swimming pools. They wanted Olympic size swimming pools because we had over 5,000 people drowning. This city is a bowl and we constantly have flood. So it's like, it doesn't make sense that children do not learn how to swim. They learn how to swim in other cities where they're not having hurricanes every other year, right? right. So it was like, these are the things. They said put washers and dryers in all the schools because most of the wash up wrecks were closed right after the storm. Just practical, everyday things that these children needed to thrive. So these are the things the community wanted, needed, asked for, big for. Plus they want our children to have, you know, the apps and all that. They want them to have all the technology plus all the basic stuff. Whatever you wanted to get into to be able to have that. And we should have had that because we had all this money coming. Right? Right. But what happened economically is because the charter schools rolled out very differently in the ones. They were a business model. And a business model, you're trying to make profits. And they started calling our children human capital. Well, education matters, right? I think education is crucial. And if most uh, uh, black New Orleanians, black Americans are attending failing public schools, that's a very, that's a, that's a challenge in and of itself, right? Um, if we're going to work jobs at other people's businesses and the wages that are set there are not determined by us, we don't, if we don't control those jobs, then we're gonna be having those income that you just described in the statistics that you read. So if we're not creating our own jobs, creating our own businesses, it's hard to come up from under that, okay? Um, there's no one answer to that question, but collective economics is something that I know that, like there are examples of that, that we can point to where black people were collectively pooling their economics together by supporting one another's businesses, living in communities where we protected ourselves, we looked out for one another, and we didn't, we didn't disperse our resources throughout the, the community. So if we're not collectively pulling it together, it's gonna to continue to be dispersed. It's very hard to, uh, to, to, to come together, to, to, to rise up, if you will. Uh, I think that's, a, that's, a, that's gonna be a crucial component to trying to do that. 
it's like uh, just like voter dilution, you know, it's economic dilution as well. Yes, I am. Born and raised in New Orleans, New Orleans East. I was born at Methodist Hospital. It was a charity. Do you live in New Orleans? I do still live in New Orleans. I still live in the same neighborhood, the same house that my parents bought when I was uh, nine months old. The house we evacuated from for Katrina. Well, what district do you represent? I represent District 99. I like to call it the fun district. Um, I have part of New Orleans East, and I have the Lord Knight Ward um, from the St. Bernard Parish line up to Esplanade, from the river on over to about, about Marie. So I have Frenchman Street, Bywater, Marigny, St. Rock neighborhood. Yeah, the fun, vibrant district. Fun district? Yes. So what would you say are some positive attributes about the city of New Orleans? Oh, the positives are the food, the people, the culture, the fact that you can literally walk past history no matter what part of the city you walk into, what part you, in, you are in. Um, not long ago, I visited McDonald 19 in the Lord Night Wall, which is on uh, St. Claude. And uh, one of the ladies who was one of the little girls that desegregated that school, she bought the school and turned it into a museum. So it was, that was interesting to know that that piece of history was still here and something that we drive by every day. And uh, it felt good to know that it was also in my the district that I represent. Um, what's positive is the fact that if you live in the heart of the city, you can walk just about anywhere. And any place you go to, you can get good food. You can meet great people, either visiting or locals and just the culture and the makeup of the city. Those are positive attributes. With our local unions, we're trying to get those back into the school or trying to get schools partnered with the different local unions. Also, it's um, we have to expand access to broadband. There are a lot of jobs that have gone um, tele teleworking, but that broadband isn't available in all communities. And unfortunately, most of the communities that the broadband isn't available and the people that live there look like us. Uh, so if you act, increase that access, you increase uh, the economic opportunity, the job opportunities for people. Um, when you have the students that, you know, you never know what kind of pandemic is gonna come up next, which will require our children to do remote learning. If they have access to broadband and reliable technology, the children can get a better education, uh, can, um, feel more engaged and feel like they're actually progressing in their learning. But it, it, it's just those things that we need to and make sure we have access in our communities too. Um, businesses, organizations need to promote the black employees that's there, promote them beyond the entry level or the mid-level management to upper management and then open up the recruiting to um, African Americans as well. And I believe that that would increase. Changed uh, uh, the demographic of the city and where people uh, lived. Hope Six is that federal grant that changed public housing. And then of course, Katrina, 80% of the city was underwater. So, you know, you had to get it where you could get it. And uh, a lot of the folk who live in Santa City, especially black folk, indigenous folk, were pushed out. But gentrification has been real in the Santa City, uh, along the river. You know, I'm from the Law 9, you know, uh, uh, if you know the evolution of the Law 9th Ward, it was, you know, white folks by the river and black folks from St. Claude to back of town, you know, which they call back of Florida Avenue, they call it Bayou Avenue now. Uh, you know, it was black folk who lived in Upper 9, you know, now they call it Bywater. You know, to me, the whole city Bywater, but that's the name they gave that community once it started being gentrified.
fact that we're so stuck on being New Orleans, you know, too often, uh, I think, because we're so unique and because our culture is so unique uh, to this place and this space that we haven't always been that open about doing things another way, about accepting things another way. And I think in many cases, uh, that's been a, a detriment. I used to say a joke that Jesus was gonna pick New Orleans for the site for the second coming. Because you know, every time you turn around, man, we get in the show. We got our great culture, but so much poverty, so much crime, you know, so much misery. And so Jesus was gonna say, for the second coming, I'm going to New Orleans. And everybody was gonna be happy that Jesus picked New Orleans for the second coming. And then all of a sudden, somebody in New Orleans was gonna say, yeah, that's nice, but we ain't zoned for second coming. And we gonna go back to Houston or Dallas <laughs> or Atlanta. And we're going to be fucked again, yeah. The types of tools that they can benefit from to get their business pumped out there, to get their, that recognition, um, the cost for the, the, uh, the cost of, of um, advertisement, the uncertainty of trustworthy advertisement or where they can advertise, the access to that advertisement. Uh, sometimes it lends to, again, how different crime is reported in areas, and sometimes the lack of police presence makes some folks that visit unsure or a little leery into going into areas. But the areas that they're concerned about going into, that's where we are. That's where our communities are. That's where our community businesses are located. So, um, again, it just goes back to how how the crime in the, the city is portrayed and how it's um, put out there by, by media, whether it's, the, whether it's the news, whether it's articles. Um, and again, with the lack of advertisement and showing, hey, this part of the city is, is safe. It's just as safe as anywhere else. But again, that leads to also the lack of police presence in certain areas. I mean, it's the cost of living, right? Free market. So. If you're trying to incentivize developers or people to come in to clean up a neighborhood, revitalize and redevelop a neighborhood, but there aren't controls in place to keep the people who are there, there to be able to enjoy and, and, and benefit from this in, in, uh, revitalization, then those folks end up getting pushed out, which is essentially gentrification and trying to find that proper balance. Because how do you uh, entice a developer or somebody who is business minded to come in and invest if they can't participate in a free market and if the cost of labor, if the cost of materials, if the cost of construction and development is rising, they're going to be seeking a profit on that, right? So even the most well-intentioned developer, the most well-intentioned uh, investor is going to be looking for some sort of return to make their business sustainable. But where do you find that balance between capping what needs to be kept to ensure that the people who are in those communities aren't displaced. And I think that's something that we struggle with, in a, that, we, that we struggle with in a free market economy. So if there is an ownership, if people don't own their properties, if people uh, don't have a, a, a way to stay in those properties, in most cases they end up being displaced. So it's, 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 it's a number of contributing factors, you know, it's, it's, it's our tax policy, it's our zoning policies. It's how we award incentives and how do we hold developers accountable to ensure that if you're being incentivized to redevelop an area, or redevelop property in an area, that we're making sure that protections are put in place so that the people who don't have the means to stay there are provided with the means to stay there. In a big way, whereas the money did not stay in the walls. It came in, it went right back out. And so that's part of the economic story, but Ashanti can talk about the teachers and the middle class and all that, so. That's right, because for the life of me, I can't understand why we have majority black legislative lawmakers and majority black people, but economically, as you guys put it, we're not controlling our own destiny. We're not controlling our own destiny education-wise either. So why do you think that is? Well, that's very simple. Even though we have black leadership on the face of it, the machine that runs it is, is white. So we have black people in positions of power, but they're doing the bidding of people who don't look like us, people who don't come from our struggle, people who don't understand our children, people 
who came here with the intent to profit. And so this was never about reforming education in New Orleans. This was literally about dismantling public education to bring in what they saw as a model that would keep black children poor and uneducated and keep black people poor and uneducated. Because what, what Ashana spoke to um, with the firing of almost 8,000 people was a dismantling of the black middle class. And so when you fire 7,500 plus people and you disperse them everywhere, you take away their livelihoods, then of course what, you, what you've done is in essence purple an, an entire population of people. is part of the lifeline and, and the blood of our city. And so when you constantly have, um, so let's step back a little bit. A lot of our culture bearers um, are working class people. And there's, a, but there's also a, a huge group of them that are middle class. And a lot of our educators were also culture bearers as well. And so when we, we speak about pre-Katrina a lot, because it, it was literally like the, the huge domino that tipped over everything else. And so when you eliminated that class of people, you eliminated a lot of the culture that came within it. Also, <clears throat> when the way you eliminate a lot of the culture is having a lot of outside entities coming in now and teaching, i.e. transplants. Because even when our young people um, were in K through 12, the educators that were there were from New Orleans and understood the culture that on, on the, how they speak and how they communicated with each other. It wasn't a fear thing. Well, when they said something or when they spoke a certain way, they didn't try to necessarily correct them with it. And so now when a lot of our young people, they're afraid to even speak in certain manners when they've grown up in a certain way. That's the same question uh, between Ambika and, Mandela, and Mandela. You know, that's the question that's being asked in, uh, in South Africa, parts of Africa now. You know, how can we be 99% of the population and uh, only control or have 1% of the economic development? That has been the challenge of indigenous people throughout this world. Now, a lot of it has to do with uh, education. A lot of it has to do with discrimination. I mean, from the World Bank to local banks. Look at the history, follow Red Line, you know, and where it happened in, in communities of color, uh, uh, communities of black folk. Couldn't get access uh, to loans, couldn't get access to mortgages, couldn't get access uh, to, to grants. Those challenges have, been, have existed for the last uh, 100 years and still exist. And, and that's one of the reasons why black political leadership has to be intentional and unapologetic. And black industry leaders, and black filmmakers, and black business folk. You know, they gotta be intentional about, you know, uh, who shares in the economic pie, or, or who participates. One person can't do the job alone. You know, and, and I always tell my citizens, I asked you to put me in this position, but I still need your help. I still need you to inform me as to what's going on. I can't possibly know what's going on in each neighborhood of all 44,000 people. You have to reach out to me. You have to engage with me. Um, when I give information, listen, read the information, listen to the information, but continue to work with me and let me know what it is that's going on, what you need help with. Had a citizen last week, there was a um, a light post that was, it hadn't worked, there was had been replaced, but that light post was still there. Someone came and cut it and pulled it and it almost hit a house and it almost hit a car. He called me and said, hey, they're about to do the same thing with this one. I got on the phone, made some phone calls, entered you went out and fixed that problem. But it's about the community being engaged and informing me as to what's going on. And that's not just me, that's with all of your elected officials. We asked you to let us do a job, but we need you to help us do that job. Don't put us in office and leave us. Mm -hmm. You know, we still need your help. 
we still need the help of our citizens. And I believe if we get, if, if our community gets to that way of thinking and that way of operating, the city can improve. It can improve for the natives, the people who have been here, the people who were born here. I was gonna say how the culture and economic time tie in is because we had two thirds less children be tapped as gifted and talented. Yeah. After Hurricane Katrina, because white people through their white gaze they did not see our children as gifted and talented, and how that impacts them economically. The jazz musicians, some of them make money just by playing jazz. Second one, you know, you have artists and painters, you have the um, Terrace Osborne, Lionel Milton's, all these people who got their, who had IEPs and got art teachers to come and a lot of them from the community and help them with their art, right? And help them with their talent. A lot of our musicians, the first time they got an instrument was in public school. You had a lot of these schools as these charts recreate, they said music wasn't even important. Art wasn't even important. We're gonna focus only on reading and math and to the outside person that sounds great but to, in a city like new orleans where you have a good at least one eighth of the city makes their money gets at least a side money off of music and art hustles to actually sustain themselves that connection of art and commerce and survival is key but not only that antonio travis and this is not my story antonio travis who is the director of black men rising who is a young person who came up and organized and he likes to tell a story about how he got suspended for five days because he said he called one of his friends baby twice and a, um a, a teacher it wasn't a teacher a teacher's assistant they were saying something he was agreeing he said yeah you heard me to agree and they said that that was ghetto and ignorant and that was his third strike, so he got five days. That is literally how we speak. Like what he says is that's embedded in me. To get me to not say you heard me if I agree with you or call somebody a dead when I'm like, you know, it's a term of endearment. But not only that, our boys is getting written up constantly for saying the word baby. Because these young, a lot of these young white women didn't understand that baby was not a sexual whatever at them. That's just a word that our young people use. He makes three in January. His birthday is January. We was in the middle of the year. So I was like, okay. So the teacher was like, no. All he does is play with Legos. Whoop de whoop. He he has never shown any he has never shown any of that at home. He has not seen that kind of stuff on television. I monitor his television viewing. I had to go and say, I don't know what kind of trauma happened to you, young lady. But for you to accuse my three year old child on the spectrum of sexually molesting you. Because he put, he was probably upset. And when he's upset, he will put his head on my chest. Because I, I embrace him. Because at the time, he was three. He's a baby. I hold my baby, and he puts his head on my chest. The fact that you sexualized my three-year-old, my non-verbal three-year-old, I don't think this is the feel for you. Obviously, you have past trauma. Now, the mother and me, want to punch her in the face for trying to put that on my child like she literally wrote that in a and wanted to put that on my child's record so that my three-year-old would have went to kindergarten as a some type of sexual deviant because he was sad and he was three but like that's the mindset you're dealing with so anything our children do our children dance a certain way because of our culture they'll look at that as sexual play he's gyrating whatever whatever now my child is punished because he dances how we dance they say baby they say honey they touch a lot I, we were touchy feely city so people touch and hug you said they gonna rub your back uh, you, they don't know boundaries they touch that's that's a trigger that's aggression you know, so we need to be corrected. We're the savages that need to be, you know, how, how black people have always been viewed, right? We're, we're the savages that need to be tamed and they're coming down to tame us and teach us their ways, right? Not understanding in some of the ways y'all are very cold and dysfunctional. Where's the poor black boy that went into school and just shot everybody up randomly who he didn't even know? Show them pictures of those boys. Oh, that's right. They don't exist. So... Instead of looking at themselves and the things they're missing and the, the, the relationship problems they have, what they come to do is pathologize us, over-sexualize us. 
And it's, I feel like it's a way of deflection. And they're not dealing with their own trauma. But when you come in and you have that mentality and you look at my three-year-old and you see a sexual aggressor. And if you met my son, all he does is play video games, play on my iPad, and barely talk. Like, <laughs> right. friends, people who make side hustles, you know, playing in second lines of, uh, like performing in different things locally. But there are a number of people that are like world-renowned artists that make a full living doing that. They've traveled the world, and like Ashana said, their first time with an instrument was in a public school, and because that is missing. You have to ask, like, who is going to be the next generation of trombone shorty, John Baptiste? We're not going to get people like that anymore. Or we're not going to get the leaders of the Hot 8 Brass Band that can travel to any country and be easily recognizable because there is no music in the school anymore. And I just want to kind of draw us back to just kind of make sure that it's explained what was stolen from us. You know, what was actually stolen from us. New Orleans was uniquely in the sense that most of the educators in this city were black. Most of the educators in this city were black men and women. We had, you know, we had them both. They were certified, they were experienced, they had a uh, master's plus 30, all these type of degrees. In New Orleans, New Orleans was better at educating black urban youth than anywhere else. And we didn't believe that about ourselves because it's easy to tell black people, you know, something negative about themselves and they believe it. But one of the examples that was given to me was given by somebody that was a recruiter for the service, for the armed services. And he was talking about how he had traveled from Baltimore, Philadelphia, o Oakland, you know, all of these different cities recruiting. And he said New Orleans had one of the highest rates of black children from just coming just come and take the test passing the test to join the service than a lot of the other cities around the country and that is not something that was measured or told to us and so when they came and they told us that we were a failing system i would say this we were a deteriorating system because our buildings were falling apart we didn't have money you know what i'm saying so yes it was deteriorating it wasn't what it used to be but had the that veteran staff, that black staff that was teaching those New Orleans kids were giving these brand new buildings that you see out here and all of the money and resources that you see had came to this city, no telling. I, I don't even have to imagine. I already know what would have happened to education in this city. Yeah. We would have blown it out the water. And we have to acknowledge that that is a true reason why that could not have happened. Because we were already blowing it out the water with, with, with dilapidated yeah. buildings, you know, and no money. And if we, were, if we had the things that these people were given and they just threw away and stole and no telling what we would be, and that was stolen from us. what it's gonna look like. I just hope that it's still something I recognize. I do hope that um, with keeping the city that I grew up knowing, it still has opportunities and there's still more, um, more being created in our city to encourage um, the African Americans to stay and more opportunities for us to grow in other businesses and other business areas and not just in hospitality, not just having to open up your own business, um, but they have an opportunity in these big tech businesses that are coming here. I have a lot of tech companies coming here and um, hopefully with that policy, with those policy changes and whichever mayor is going to be in place in 2030 or 2028, <laughs> you know, we have, we just have opportunities for the citizens of the world. And, um, but I, I, my crystal ball is kind of foggy right now. I just don't know what it's going to look like in 2030. 
but again I just hope that it's a place that is um, that I have grown to know and um, it's still a place that the world has come to love talks about it often when, when she says like you know you have you have less kids more money and you're doing worse than prior to Katrina and you know when we, I, I, we often said when they try to say pre Katrina, you can't use that. This has been 17, almost 18 years. You, gotta own your failure. you own this failure. You own this failure. You you've gone through several several K through 12 kids. The, the kids for the past few years that have been graduating, all they know is charter. All they know is this failure and this dysfunction. And when you try to compare anything, you have to compare apples to apples, oranges to oranges. You know. I can't compare myself to these three women because I am a man. The only thing we can compare is, is the black experience. Anything other than that, we have to stop. And so you try to compare pre-Katrina to now, where you had, again, more certified and qualified teachers. That's that's one of the main things that we miss. I think that's the most, I'm sorry to cut you off, but I really, I think that's the most important resource that we're missing. Because money aside, even though money is important, but the money couldn't replace the compassion and the commitment and the experience and the education and that that staff had. just to give you an had. example, we were in the middle of a whole crack epidemic in the 90s. Right. And somehow our schools and high schools still managed to have school dances that ended at 1 and 2 o'clock in the morning. You know, talent shows. All kinds of things that were interactive because those were people that was from New Orleans, lived in the neighborhoods, knew the fa- yeah. knew the fa- they, they weren't afraid of us, of black children gathering, no matter how, quote unquote, it's bad on the street. Well, look, I'm certainly not a prophet, but uh, the trend is certainly uh, one that is very concerning to me. The cost of living continues to rise. Black people continue to be uh, displaced, and it's harder and harder to, to, to afford the living for many people. Uh, if you're not making, you know, significant salary, if you're not making, you know, hundred thousand dollars or more a year, a lot of people are being pushed to Jefferson Parish, St. Bernard Parish, because it just costs so much to live here. And we've seen an influx of population between 2010 and 2020, but those were majority uh, whites who moved in. I think it's great for anybody to move to the city, regardless of what your race is. So uh, anybody who wants to move here, we welcome that. Uh, but in terms of the shifting in population and demographics, that's also a trend that we're seeing across the country, not just in New Orleans, where people are wanting to move, but only those, generally those who can afford it, uh, are not black folks who've been there for their entire lives. Those are the folks that are, that are struggling. Um, in terms of what I see, look, I want to see streets without potholes, right? I want to see schools that kids can walk to and that are serving their interests, right? I want to see parents of those children be able to work jobs close to their communities that pay them a living wage. I want um, there to be parks and recreations that give our children something to do so they don't have to find uh, find themselves in, in, in predicaments where they're making bad decisions. and. I want to see a community that's 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 not leading the nation uh, per, per per capita in terms of murders. Uh, I think that that we can do that. We have the capacity to do that because we've been on that trajectory before. Right now, in 2022, uh, we got a lot to turn around. We need we need to incentivize more companies to come to this town. But I think it's we need to start with getting our schools uh, in order. So you know, those are the things that I see. And um, I know we talk about New Orleans being a resilient city. Uh, that is known, but now it's what does that mean, right? People in New Orleans are tired. The impact that that was gonna have on so many people, as far as it comes to school and jobs, you know, I, I knew that there was a problem. I just didn't know how big the problem was until after it passed. So if we continue putting in solution I mean yes yeah, solutions and policy changes such as that it could help the um, help our opportunities in which help take that stagnation away take make continue to grow it's going to be a slow growth but it um it won't be a recessive it'll be something progressive 
and again changing the school system, getting the families more involved to make sure that our children are properly educated, getting um, our children encouraged and getting them knowledge about the trades again. You know, you got doctors and lawyers, but every doctor and lawyer at some time is going to need a plumber, a mechanic, a mason. I can't fix the roof. I'm not about to try to fix the water. So you need to have people that can do those jobs that pay very, very well. Um, we have to get... Um, That just that that access it just needs to have access I believe when people have economic stability they can afford to pay for the internet if they want to get you know try to reach out for a telework afford the internet for their child who's now having to do school at home um, be able to get internet to do telemedicine but also it allows them to have the flexibility in their schedule to participate in the political process. When you have extra money and can afford to have disposable income, you can donate to campaigns. You can if not volunteer on a campaign. And that gives you access to the process. It gives you time to be involved and give your opinion as to what's going on and be a part of the whole process and, in, and and part of being on those boards and committees which give that which then lend to improving the communities that you live in. Everybody's not, you know, available to run for office, but everybody can participate in the betterment of their community. And when you have that type of influence and access, there is the chance that you can push towards the growth of the economy because you're there, you're helping, you're lending, you're lending a voice to the problem as well as coming to the table with a different set of solutions. Like I mentioned, we got to get our schools in order. You know, we need to work on our education system and we need to improve outcomes, improve our literacy rates for our young people because there's a direct correlation between a child's ability to read when they reach the third grade and where they end up when they're 18. There's a direct correlation there. And I think once we begin to invest more in education and invest more in economic opportunities, we'll see a dramatic shift in this in this city. I, I really believe that. That's how you have economic development. Look, this is a capitalist society. So economics is what drives the society. I'm, I'm a believer in social services and, 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 and strong social safety nets so that people on the margins have what they need to survive. Thank you.